Let's do it. Oh, so before we hop into this, I meant to ask you, you finally got to inbox zero. I did. I'm <laughs> one inbox. I'm one inbox. Okay. Yeah. You didn't make it through the other one? No, man. I gave up. I finally did it. So I got. I spent some time yesterday going through my personal inbox. So if you got email replies from me that are a year old, you know why. Yeah, including me. He replied to some thing I sent six months ago. So you're not alone. It's the first time that I saw it. <laughs> so I got through on my personal box. Uh, I'm good on that inbox, but my drift inbox is bloody. Disaster. Mm-hmm. All right. So today on Seeking Wisdom... We're going to talk about my favorite thing, because DC never has any idea what we're going to talk about. Nope. Uh, we're going to talk about 10 things we learned from uh, Patagonia founder Yvonne Chouinard. Damn! Yeah. I love him. I got notes. I got prepped. Um, did you know we have a conference room here at Drift named after him? I did. Which one is that? The big the, one, the big right? One. Where we have the meetings? It has to be I the love big that. One. He's the big daddy. So you put me on this book. This is – so it's funny because this is like like all the lessons. I hear them from you all the time and then I don't ever listen. You know, like I don't – He actually I, doesn't I need, listen to I any of them. I need them to become mine, you know, <laughs> yeah. like so then when yeah. I read it. So before I talk about me reading this book, when did you read it? And – because it's uh, been out for it's been, a long time. It's been ago. out for like twenty years, ten, yeah. twenty years almost. I got it. I, I want to say probably at least a decade ago. Okay, I'd say, uh, yeah, maybe fifteen years ago. Because while I was reading it, like I'm, I'm not kidding you, I felt like you were reading. I felt like you were like sitting on a, a couch just reading this to me. Boom! It was like every. It was so many of your lessons like boiled down into. Oh yeah, one none book. of my lessons are original. I'm I'm learning from other people, yeah, yeah. and I've read this book so many times now, at least four times. But I think the first time was probably 15 years ago, and I think I picked it up and gravitated to it. One because I love Patagonia clothing, yeah. but two because at the time it was one of the only non-conventional business books out there. And so I gravitated to that and and another book, which I'll send you, which you haven't read yet, mm. uh, which is just as un- unconventional and just as good. What is it? You can't uh, tell me? I can't tell you. You yet. forgot the name. I forgot the name. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a, actually put out by this guy named uh, Paul H- Hawkins, okay. who has this like um, garden gardening company called Hawkins and something. I can't remember the name of it, yeah. but it's, it's a famous brand of gardening centers throughout the U.S. Oh, that's, I like that. But it's, it's inter- interesting you said, like, if you read this book in the early 2000s. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to look it that, up. Like, yeah, go look up. it up. Get the people. Um, okay. Anyway, this book is called, so for those people listening that want to know what the hell it's called, it's not the Patagonia book. Uh, it's called Let My People Go Surfing, The Education of a Reluctant Businessman. So look that up. Just look up, you know, Patagonia, uh, whatever, on on Amazon. But I, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I feel like in 2017, a lot of things that he talked about are now people expect that, yeah. right? Boom. Here it what is. What is it? It's a book by Paul Hawken, H-A-W-K-E-N, and it's called Growing a Business. Nice. And I read that also probably 15 years ago. Okay. Another great book. More classics. More Only classics. six ninety five on Amazon. Thank me later. Uh, pick up that book. That's too expensive, man. I know. I can't spend that much money. <laughs> Uh, All right, so I pulled out. I pulled out. I pulled out a couple of lessons. I want to get your. I want. I want you to. I want. Let's let's talk about them. Okay. All right. So ten ten things from from this book. Uh, number one was he talks early on about building the place you want to work, and he said when he started the business, like he was never a businessman. He was a surfer, climber, mm-hmm. right? You know the whole. Yep. You know the whole totally. backstory. Um, and he said one thing I don't want to change, even if we got very serious, was that work had to be enjoyable on a daily basis. It's too hard not to love it every single day. Yep, I love it. So, this, so one of the things that I loved about that passage and kind of the theme of the book is is we've touched upon a lot of times, which is this kind of thought about work life balance mm-hmm. or separation, and the way that he's talking about building a business is is kind of blending those two things together. Right? Yeah, and like we, people always place. ask you, like, what's the secret to yeah. work-life balance? Yeah. And he did, and the whole thing, the whole book, right, is like they had um, child, they had you know child, child care day. at work, yep. they yep. had food there, they had yep. all the benefits to make it feel like you know there isn't a connection. There, no, there isn't a separation between the two, and you're trying to create a place that is just as homey and a place that you want to be at as you do when you're. How do you work? think that's played into like into into drift? Right, you've done, I don't know. Four, five, six companies, right? Four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> we nine, always ten. change the number. Yeah, yeah. Um, Unknown do number. You, do you think that that's something like these are conscious lessons that you try to build into? Yeah, here? I think that. I think one of the difficult things um, 
when when you read that book, and like Elias, I've had read that book, and uh, you got him to read that. Uh, he skimmed through it. Surfing was in the title, yeah, yeah. so He's, he was, he like, was just like, okay, so we can go book. surfing now. And it's like, <laughs> he no, definitely read, took it so literally. Yeah, read the book. So one of the difficulties in applying this here at Drift and at any company is that. As you read the book, it's a journey, right? And so we're trying to paint a vision of right. where we want to go. Right. That doesn't mean that right now, day one, day zero, like we have childcare, we go surfing, we do, we go rock climbing. <laughs> like it's just like, where do we want to go? Where right. do we want to steer? And that the same was true for Yvonne and his company. It's been a progression. Yeah, and in the early days of the company, it was two people, and two. so if they wanted to go go for a hike on a Tuesday afternoon, yeah. it's like. Two yeah, people no who didn't like, get paid, yeah. who work, worked out of a shack that they found the behind a building, right? And so, like, you got to take these lessons and say, well, how can we apply those mm. over time as we grow and basically have this be the inspiration for what we're trying to build? And this is like th- – these notes are like – it's like your Bible. Uh, so the second one that I pulled out was move fast. Uh, he said, you can't wait until you have all the answers before you act. It's a greater risk to phase in products because you lose the advantage of being first – with a new idea. Absolutely. We talk about it all the time. Speed, 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 speed. And it's like get out there, learn, uh, figure out what's wrong, yeah. iterate, move forward. I thought of two things when, they, when, when I read that. I thought of number one, I thought of you and Elias and just like ship it, go fast, go fast, yeah, go yeah. fast, default to wrong, mm-hmm. like go fast. The other thing I thought of was Al Reese and positioning. Oh, yeah. And you have to be – to really win, you, the best thing you can do is be first in somebody's mind. Yep. I was actually reading another book oh. and I sent I – sent, uh, DG and a couple of people on the team, a little video. I'm sending them motivational videos early He's trying in the morning. to step up. No, he's trying to step up. It's like combination of motivational. He's trying to step up his video game. So, so anyway, I recorded a video this morning. I was talking about a book that I love that I'm reading right now. It's called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far. Okay. And uh, it is by Lawrence Krauss, I believe is his last name. He's a professor. He was a young professor at Yale. He's a physicist and a, young, and a professor at, in Arizona State. And anyway, in it, he t- one of his things that he talks about is that in physics, and he's talking about Einstein and some of the great physicists, he says that, you know, all great discoveries were a byproduct of another experiment. And then he says, uh, all great discoveries come from activity. There's never been a great discovery that's come from inactivity. That's crazy. Exactly and it's so true. Like, about. how often do you just do something the first time and that's it? Right? Never. Everything. I mean, think about like even if you think about where what we're doing now, like mm-hmm. at Drift, right? That came from other other things. Absolutely. And this is a guy who's you know totally in a different realm, totally different place that he's talking about. He's talking about yeah. science and physics, experimental physics, and he's telling the same story that we're talking about here that Yvonne has, t- has taught us and that we learn every day. And Are so you his, looking at notes right now? No, no. I'm, lo- I'm looking oh, up the book. Okay. Let's not get twisted. I was There's like, no either you, you're texting yeah. right now or yeah. you're looking at notes. So Lawrence Krauss, okay. the gro- greatest story wow. ever told so far. We're giving so you far. all the books today. All the books so far. Oh, man, this, this book is blowing my mind. He's an internationally renowned, renowned award-winning theoretical physicist. Let's go. That's deep. All right, number three, uh, number three, make the best products. Mm-hmm. This one sounds so obvious, but if you break down like the reason why he said it, he said, make the best product. That's basically our mission. That's the cornerstone of our business philosophy. And he said, make the best is a difficult goal because mm-hmm. it doesn't mean among the best. No. Nope. It doesn't mean best at a particular price point. It means make the fucking best, the best. product, yeah. period. And this is the part of the book that really resonated to me 15 years ago or 10 years ago whenever I read it because I was so obsessed around the craft of building a product, in our case, a software product mm. back then. But it, this really spoke to me as a yeah. maker. Uh, I was once well, a maker. Like, this is like – I'll look at Amy when I said – this is like – this is I can I can feel this from you because this is like – you know, if there's a typo here, if this image doesn't look right, all the way to like if the product is wrong, like yeah. you have, you think about those details. Yeah, I and want, I want to be the best. Because that to matters. The it's best the thing. sum. It's the sum of all those little things. All the details. And matter. that's what they say, right? Every down to the thread, everything matters mm-hmm. to them. Uh, and the other thing within make the best product is that your product needs to be identifiable. So take the logo off, and you yeah. know that that's a oh Patagonia, my goodness, right? man! This you is talk really about woo! that all the time. I'm going to faint. Explain this that. This is so great. Explain that one. Right? That's the, that's, the, when, that's the ultimate craft, right? When you design and you build something, that's so recognizable if you took the logo off. Right now, I'm holding a Starbucks coffee, 
but I take this logo off, and you know this is Starbucks coffee. You know right that's here. not a Dunkin' Cup. You know this that's not, not a, a Honeydew, whatever. Hun- Honeydew or whatever they call themselves. This is a Starbucks cup, right? That is the care that has been put into the design and packaging and iterations because this has changed over the last five to ten years. Uh, you can still recognize this without the logo. Yep. And on the heels of that one, number four was good design is little design. Every design at Patagonia begins with a functional need. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he quotes some guy who had, who's the head of design at Braun. Um, He said that good design is as little design as possible. Complexity is often a sure sign that the functional needs have not been solved. (laughs) Come on now. See, right now in the software world where we are, Mm. people want to talk about jobs to be done and this framework and that framework and that framework. Here's a book from 20 years ago that just breaks it down even simpler. It's not even about software. This is about making clothes. Yeah, because we in software get twisted in our heads like that there's something different about what we're building. And to me, there's nothing different about what we're building, right? right? It just so happens to be put in software. It's still about building a product. At the end, we're still selling to humans. So it's still about serving a functional need for that person. And this is perfect, uh, perfect, like little, little uh, intro to the next one, which is number five. I didn't know this is where this came from, which is innovation or invention. Uh, And he said, I'd much rather design and sell products so good and unique that they have no competition, but successful inventing requires a tremendous amount of raw energy and time. He goes, blah, blah, blah. Goes on to say, like, it's better to, you know, uh, innovate on an existing pattern. You know what? I've read read this book so many times, and I've talked so many (laughs) times about innovate versus invent. I had no idea this is where I got it from. You didn't? <laughs> no. You forgot? It's unbelievable. It's amazing. I talk about this. Uh, Dave can attest to how much I talk about every this internally day. every day. It's amazing. And it's so hard to get it through someone's head, which yep. is like you don't need to invent. All we need to do is innovate on an existing pattern. It's crazy. He said, uh, uh, since, since you forgot, I'll read more of this. Yeah. It says, it may take 30 years to come up with an invention, but within a few years or months, there can be thousands of innovations yeah. spawned from that original idea. Innovation can be achieved much more quickly because you already start with an existing product idea or design. Do you hear him? This is a man not writing this years ago, crazy. not talking about software. And think about how much this applies yeah. to everything that we build here every day and other people are out there building. Yeah, so he says like he says think of it like a creative cook, right? Mm-hmm. Use the original uh, as a recipe for inspiration, then close that book and then go do your your own thing. Exactly. And I always think about you should um if you go to uh, your medium, which is just medium.com slash decancel, I think, there's a post that you wrote about like how uh, how a, how a product designer would design the chair? Chair, yeah. yeah, yeah. Remember that? Yeah, absolutely. And so they would, you know, the way to design a chair is to do what Yvonne talks about, which is to first look at an existing invention, which is the chair, right. uh, which has stood the test of time, right. and then before designing your chair, understand how that works from a physics standpoint, right, and a mechanical standpoint and design standpoint, and then to innovate on top of that already accepted invention versus the way that we in software too often want to uh, create something. I show the pic- a picture of a chair that makes no sense. It right? looks it like has, a spaceship. It looks like, like a spaceship. Yeah. It has no legs. It wraps around your body. <laughs> and this is how we in software today would design a chair. Makes no sense, yeah. right? Because we want to we want to run too fast towards uh, invention, which is, again, about the ego, mm-hmm. the ego taking over, mm-hmm. right? When that happens, it's your ego that's taking over. And the thing is, though, I think, so like you're a product guy, like an engineer by background, but I think here's the thing for the people that listen and that aren't, mm-hmm. that can be, this lesson, it can be applied to everything. everything. And we try to use it for like, mm-hmm. let's say we're writing new copy, right? Yeah, Home how do you do it copy, in marketing? Right? In marketing would be, I would go look at related books on Amazon and mm-hmm. read Amazon reviews there we and go. use the words that people use. There we go. We send out a ton of feedback surveys after we do webinars and yeah. stuff and we get real customers words Mm -hmm. and so then when we go and create new website pages or new messaging we're not we're not inventing anything Mm -hmm. we're taking the words that people actually use and then tweaking that to be you know our own and and tightening it up a little bit simple not easy it's crazy you just have to look simple not easy always and a seeking wisdom community member punked me Uh the other day what happened because i'm always saying simple not easy what'd you do and uh and he was commenting on my strava which is my cycling performance yeah and I was complaining about the wind. Yeah. And he said, uh, he replied to me, he said, just pedal harder. Damn. Simple, not easy. <laughs> oh, that's ice damn. cold. You know who you are. You punked me. Good. Yeah. Keep pushing I love him. it. He needs that. Uh, all right. Six was the best brand is human. This was the one that I I love the most. Um he talked about our brand. This is like him talking about Patagonia's branding and marketing efforts. He says they're simple. We tell people who we are. <sighs> 
Uh, we don't have to create a fictional character like the Marlboro Man or a fake responsible caring campaign like Chevron's We Agree. Writing fiction is much more difficult than nonfiction. Uh, our image is a direct reflection of who we are and what we believe. That's the How best. good is that? I mean, that's like everything that we try to do That's here, everything right? that we try to do in terms of building a brand and our own marketing. You don't have to fake it. Don't have to fake it. It's not about the product. It's not about this. It's about building this, revealing ourselves, yep. right, and talking about ourselves and being honest about what we're trying to do and fix. Seven was uh, write as though we were the customers because we are. So all the people that worked at Patagonia. Oh, they wait, wor- wait, wait. All my, all, everything I talk about is basically this. in this book. Yeah. Every, it's insane. That's why I wanted to do this episode. Woo! It's crazy. <laughs> The best part is that you forgot. <laughs> the amazing thing is that I it forgot. It becomes just yeah. a part. So It's just so ingrained in yeah. me. I don't even think but about it. But this is such an important point. And, and for us, this means like this is why everyone on our team does customer support yep. or everyone on our team talks to customers. Mm-hmm. And we all work at a company where you can use the product every day yep. because it, this is the whole thing at Patagonia. They knew how to write copy, how to build products, how to do marketing launches, how to design new stuff. Because they were there. They wore yeah. it every day. Yep. You don't have to fake it. Mm-hmm. And so these two things back to back just show, you know. <sighs> Um, what else? Yeah, so he says branding is telling people who we are. Promotion is selling people on our product. And our promotional efforts all begin with the product. And this is your thing. I love that distinction, what? right? We should take that internally, like branding versus promotion. Yeah. Right? Two different job different. functions. Yeah, very different. Well, we, talk about, it's what we talked about recently, like the role of marketing. We talked yep. about like uh, you know, we air cover and ground cover. Yep, it's exactly this, right? Which is we've talked about internally. Like we have two functions in marketing and probably two different types of people will do the one of you know these two things one is air cover yep. and that's about branding yep. in this case it's the brand it's the halo yep. it's creating that opportunity which is like what you're listening to right now right yeah that's this air doesn't cover. drive leads nope. right uh how will we well, measure it does. this it does uh, yeah. don't tell them that i won't tell them uh and then the ground cover which is about promotions mm-hmm. right which is around campaigns uh, around a specific action that we're trying to drive exactly. uh okay number eight this is like be a product, he said, be a product driven company. And this, I feel like this is something you've written a million times. We're, he said, we are a product driven company. That means the product comes first and the company exists to create and support our products. This is different from a distribution company who's probably, uh, whose primary concern may be service rather than product. Yep. And I would take this and kind of build on top of it and say, we are a customer driven company and we're here to serve the customer. Mm. And we do that by being a product driven company. And uh, and that's how we think about things. So we don't put product ahead of the customer. Right. We put the customer first and the product in service of the customer and then all of us behind those two things. Yeah. Love it. Uh, number nine was – I made this one up. But this I wanted to mention this with you. And it was basically – Wait, you made it up? Yeah, I made not, it up. Okay. It's not like a direct line from the book. But mm-hmm. uh, the CEO always has to light the fire and be paranoid. That was what I called it. Uh, and he, This is just a comment on me. I, think. <laughs> I wanted to say this. Yeah. And I wanted people to hear this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this, was a, this is a great line. I think this is important for all managers, CEOs, regardless – um, he said, even when there is no crisis, the wise leader or CEO will invent one, not by crying wolf, but by challenging the employees with change. Talk to me about this. I can't talk about myself. Okay, so you, do, what do I – do so you think I like the fire? This actually wasn't even – I didn't – I kind of read this part of yeah. you, but to me, like I'm a huge Patriots fan, sports fan. This oh, yeah. reminds me of Bill Belichick, yep, right? absolutely. Which is, you know, they could win the Super Bowl and the next day all he's saying is like, you know what? In the third quarter though, we ran that play. We dropped that pass. Yeah. That was bullshit, mm-hmm. right? And you're like, well, are you kidding me? We yeah. just won the Super Bowl. Yeah. Well, this is what we're having. And so – I think that's well, an important. Why does he do that? Most people would say, "Hey, man, yeah, let's chill out." This we came just up the in the Bowl. Radical Candor book too. It's like mm-hmm. even when things are going great and your top performers like do something awesome, you still, you know, to keep pushing and keep improving and mm-hmm. constantly learning. You got to mm-hmm. find things even mm-hmm. when things are great. Yep. Uh, and I think it just creates, especially that. with top performers, because if you don't do it with yeah. top performers, if you just say, "Hey, man, it's Come. awesome, we won the Super Bowl," then their learning will stop. And they will lose interest in moving forward. It's complacency. Right? Like complacency, complacency we talk it. about it all the time. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, uh, was was really important because I think it's – a lot of people read that the wrong way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think the urgency is important. So that's the, the 10, the last lesson was always have a sense of urgency. And uh, this is the reason why, as he said, continuous change and innovation, which was their goal as a company and ours, right, uh, require maintaining a sense of urgency. It's hard because you have a laid back corporate culture. uh, But one of the biggest mandates he he had what was to instigate change. So Mm -hmm. managers at the company were always pushed to drive urgency, Uh, even though everybody's playing the long game. 
urgency, 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 and that comes back to light the fire. And so I need help from the seeking wisdom community because I think I might be too laid back. <laughs> Well, well, Dave just passed no, out. I Dave just, just passed out. I don't out. know. Please don't help him. I'm all set. He is. I can tell you, he's plenty urgent. Yeah. Uh, so you know, keep the tweet at him. Do whatever. Just don't. Don't. Please do that. help me. I need more urgency. <laughs> all right. I need your help. So those those are ten lessons, uh, ten things that we learned from Patagonia. I learned them for the first time. Even though this is just like sounds. I just basically read a book about DC. I um, wish I wrote that book. Before we wrap up, just want to, you know, do fan love. Fan love for the week. Damn. Do we uh, have fan love? We got fan love. Let me let me read like this who? for a second. Uh, this is a five-star review only okay. from uh, the homie Big Fan 26 <laughs> What's up, homie? <laughs> he said, huge thanks to the team at Drift for dropping so much wisdom. I've been bringing all the lessons straight to my company, and we are huge fans. You should all start asking for six-star reviews. Love, Natesh, and the team at B12. Natesh, you heard, the, you heard the homie Natesh, B12. Check them out. They're in New York. I know who Natesh you is. You do? He's my homie. Respect. Uh, respect. And uh, Natesh, B12.com. Check them out. See how we shout it out? Yeah. And that's why you need to leave a six-star review <laughs> only. Right? We're moving to six stars now. Uh, six-star review only on iTunes or on Amazon for the book Hypergrowth. And, uh, and then we'll shout you out. We'll share you with the community. We yeah. give back. Right? We like to give back. Speaking of giving back, if you haven't gotten your tickets for Hypergrowth, before okay. we started recording this podcast, DC and I were just reviewing the list of speakers. Woo, we man. haven't announced any of them I can't yet, wait. but it's fire. Fire. Uh, fire. Three fire emojis. Three fire emojis. And we, we want to hook you up as being a loyal listener of the podcast, so we got you covered. Uh, if you go to hypergrowth.drift.com, buy a ticket, come see us in Boston this fall, use the promo code Seeking Wisdom. Yep. save 400 bucks. It's only $99 ticket. It's wow. basically basically free it's man you're too nice too, you're too nice. nice yeah and so if i come to this conference you mm. call hyper growth yes is it going to be a bunch of boring industry speakers no okay the one mission that i got from from you dc in launching this conference yeah. was we need to launch a conference but we can't make it like every other marketing tech conference okay what's so it going to be like our lineup might feature olympians uh, what? musicians what chefs Woo! and ceos and so all the people that you do want to hear from but then also a little bit of people who are going to take you out of your comfort zone a little bit and teach you something new. It's not about marketing. It's not about tech. It's about business and personal growth. And that's what hyper growth is. Ooh. All right. Get your ticket. We'll see you there. We'll hang together. We'll wear t-shirts. Hyper growth. We'll take over the city. Yeah. Six star reviews only. Also, <laughs> please, it. please, a little shout out in your comments about Amy. Let's give Amy the whole some love. thing makes the whole thing happen behind the scenes. All right. Give Amy love. Peace. See ya.